Hello and welcome to our presentation. My name is Professor Brian Henning and I'm a professor of philosophy and environmental studies at Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington. Hi, and I'm Pat McCormick. I'm a professor of religious studies and Christian ethics at Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington. We're very happy to be with you to here today to be chatting about climate literacy, integral ecology and care for our common home. We know that this is a challenge for many of us in education today, and we'd like to share with you some of our reflections on this and hope that they're of use to you in your work in this important labor. So first of all, as we all know, this topic is frequently presented as though it were very controversial. Our political parties have adopted uh, positions which make it seem as though it's a 50-50 uh, proposition in our country, but actually, uh, when we look at uh, this more closely, we find that uh, three quarters of Americans are at least cautious about climate change and um, fewer than a fifth of Americans are dismissive or doubtful. Uh, the controversy is in many ways manufactured and this will be true of the students in, in your classroom. So uh, just like evolution or uh, cell mitosis or other topics, um, it's, it's best to see it primarily as a scientific topic that your students uh, need and want to learn about uh, to be um, uh, conversant in, in an important topic uh, in our world. The, Polling on, in particular, on whether or not climate change should be taught, uh, we find if we look at whether or not it should be taught in our, our schools, NPR did a survey a few years ago uh, on this topic, and, and you might pause and look at this at, at your leisure. But if we were just to, to zoom in sort of on the, the left-hand side, on the overall uh, view, what we find is that, that actually only 8% of teachers think that climate change should not be taught and 86% uh, think that it should in one way or another uh, be taught. So I, our, our view is, is that um, many of you out there are interested in doing uh, teaching related to climate literacy, and, but not maybe feeling confident about exactly how best to do that. And so part of our talk today is to try and give you some confidence in how you might do that. In fact, on this same poll, when they ask teachers what was keeping them from uh, bringing it into their classroom, what most of them said was that they, oops, that they do not teach um, subjects related to climate change. Uh, that, and we have added that their students were too young or that they themselves don't know enough about it or have the materials to teach. Uh, this, this talk today we're hoping will actually try and persuade you that uh, climate change is relevant and related to just about every subject I can think of from psychology, sociology, uh, biology, chemistry, physics, theology, ethics, uh, language, English, history, right? There are versions of all of those disciplines which, it, which would allow you to engage your students. So I'd encourage you to not think of this as just a scientific uh, topic. We'll actually be uh, making some claims about that later in the presentation. And then further, in terms of not knowing enough about it, or not, right, that we're also hoping uh, to be able to help you to feel more confident in, in bringing this into your classroom. And as a double encouragement for those of us who teach in Catholic education, um, Pope Francis in Laudato Si makes it um, really clear that the uh, climate change issue and the ecological crisis are the kinds of issues that need to be approached by a whole variety of disciplines and uh, sources of wisdom. So for those of us teaching in just about any field, we have something important to contribute to this important conversation about our planet and about the people on our planet. And um, to support teachers who want to do this work, um, it's helpful for us to remember that uh, the Pope argues in Laudato Si that um, education is an absolutely essential task in uh, coming to address uh, climate change and that the role of the educator is really primary to the work we need to do uh, to address climate change in the world. So we should be encouraged as teachers to know that we have that kind of support in our Catholic community and a recognition that each of us from our various disciplines can play an important role in contributing to uh, the resolution of this crisis. One. So in the first section here, what we like to do is share a little bit of the basics of climate science, just to give you a little bit more familiarity. Some of you, this will be old hat, others, this is maybe the first time you've considered these ideas. 
uh, pause uh, obviously along the way uh, as is useful. Uh, there's lots of, of great information. So the first thing we'd like to discuss is the uh, to try and help understand the difference between weather and climate. These are frequently misunderstood. Uh, if one analogy that we get from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to, to, to think of the difference between weather and climate is, as, it, as you see on your screen on the left-hand side here, the weather is what's happening outside. It's what you're going to wear that day for, for what you're expecting to have happen that day. Uh, whereas on the other hand, climate is sort of collectively, what kind of clothes do you collectively have in your closet? Uh, if you're like us up here in the Northwest, uh, where it, it gets very cold and very hot, uh, we have thick winter coats as well as shorts in our closet. But if we lived uh, in the South, uh, in the Southwest or the Southeast, maybe we wouldn't have a winter coat in there, right? Because our climates are different. So the weather is highly variable. Uh, between two days here in Spokane and maybe where you are, we could have a huge swings, 30 to 40 degrees between days. Uh, today, it, it, it snowed three inches and now it's sunny and it's just melted off. Uh, that's pretty typical for our weather here uh, at this time of year. But on the other hand, climate has a relatively low variability and is, is really uh, concerned with uh, decades or even millennia and usually larger geographical areas as well. One way of, of all, a separate analogy for thinking about the relationship between weather and climate is to think of the relationship of weather is to climate as surface body temperature is to core body temperature. What I mean by that is um, the, the surface of body temperature of, like of your skin can vary quite considerably. If I go for a walk out in the cold, my fingers will get quite, quite, uh, quite cold. I come inside and I'll get those little prickles in my fingers. Um, and if I had a thermal imaging camera, it, it would probably reveal that my hands would go from 30 degrees uh, to 60 degrees within a relatively short period of time. So my, my external surface body temperature varies quite a bit like the weather. But on the other hand, my core body temperature varies uh, very little. Um, hopefully it stays right around 98.6. And when it is a little bit high, um, I, I know it. Even if it's only high by a few degrees, uh, I know it. And that's similar with the climate. Uh, um, a change of a degree or two of the climate uh, is actually quite a large change, just like it is if you're running a temperature of 101 or 102, that's quite a serious um, uh, change. Now, in terms of how, uh, what we look at when we're trying to figure out uh, what's changing and, and uh, why, some of the phenomena that scientists look at uh, are as diverse as the actual temperature of the air, but also, the temperature of, of the oceans, the size uh, of the uh, glaciers, ice sheets, both land-based and sea-based, uh, the changes in the um, sea level rise, how often uh, and large different events are. Ocean acidification has to do with uh, the pH of the ocean. Uh, carbon dioxide uh, interacts with the ocean, absorbs some of that, turns into carbonic acid, and so uh, one of the separate phenomena from temperature is, is that the ocean gets more acidic. And so we have all these different phenomena that scientists look at and say, um, what are the trend lines? What do they, what do they reveal? Um, so we have a, a changing world. Most of us would recognize uh, the polling suggests that uh, about 72% of Americans recognize that things are changing, um, uh, but people are still uh, not entirely sure why the polling drops to about 57% of Americans um, think that they know uh, why it's changing. When you're talking about this with your students in class, um, I think it's really useful to, to imagine that there are at least three different answers or guesses that we could give as to why the, the climate is changing. Things seem different, seem weird. Many people would recognize that. Scientists are trying to say why. There are three main reasons. Is it the sun? Is it just natural variability or is it that we're changing the composition of the atmosphere? So let's look at each of these a little bit more. First, the sun. Could the sun be causing climate change? Yes, absolutely it could. Uh, if the sun was putting out more radiation, then that would definitely could cause climate change. In fact, uh, the sun does seem to go through natural cycles and, and that change the total solar irradiance that it emits over time. And 
as far as I know, those are still uh, not completely understood. So uh, if the sun was changing uh, then and, and, and putting out more radiation, more heat, then that definitely could cause climate change on our planet. The question is, let, you know, is it? So what's the sun been doing lately? What we find when we, when we ask that question um, is that uh, solar activity, which is reflected by this blue line, right? It goes up, it goes down. Um, total solar irradiance has been in a period of a relatively uh, low level activity. So solar irradiance is actually slightly down over the last few decades. So if we were just looking at the sun, what we would expect is that the, the temperature of the planet, the average surface temperature of the planet would also be going down if we're just looking at the sun. But in fact, when we look at the red line, what we find is that the average temperature of the planet is going up so that there's an inverse correlation between sun, sun's activity and the ter surface temperature of the planet. So one way of looking at this is although changes in solar activity could cause climate change, maybe did in the past, uh, if we look at the present, it doesn't line up. Could, but isn't. So the second most li likely uh, answer is, well, uh, maybe it's just natural. Uh, could natural variability explain climate change? Here, the answer is again, um, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, could uh, natural variability cause climate change? It has in the past, is it in the present? If we look at the last 800,000 years of the Earth's climate, what we find in terms of temperature uh, here is that there have been periods where it's been higher and periods where it's been lower. And in roughly every 100,000 years or so, we have periods that are, are colder or warmer. And so it is absolutely true when people point out that, uh, that the climate changes naturally, it has in the past, it will in the future. And so that's absolutely true. However, when we look at the present uh, explanation about you know, why that, those past changes have taken place, um, and we say, well, what caused the natural variability of the Earth's climate in the past? What we find is that the explanation is, is, is largely that it's variations in the Earth's orbit around the sun that has caused many of those glacial periods in the Earth's past. And that if we were just looking at those orbital variations in the, in the flatness of our orbit, the eccentricity, the, the tilt of, our, of the Earth, and the wobble, if we look at those three features, what we would find is that uh, we should expect a period of relative climactic stability for the next uh, few tens of thousands of years until very gradually we would move into a new ice age. So uh, natural variability could cause climate change, did in the past, will in the future, but it does so in a very slow way over many thousands and thousands of years. And so although it has changed in the past, if we look at the present warming, what we find uh, is that these glacial, glacial and interglacial periods, right, over the last hundreds of thousands of years, that the, the speed of change today doesn't match that what has caused natural variability in the past. We have a, a really, really fast amount of change going on, right, by this line on the right-hand side of this graph. Now, normally you would have uh, a 10th of a degree of warming over a century. We've had one degree of warming, 10 times that in one century. In this century, depending on what actions we're gonna take, we're going to have two to four degrees Celsius more change this century. That's super, super, super fast. That, that's like going from, zero outside to 90 degrees in, 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 in a minute, right? That's, that's um, extraordinarily fast. Doesn't match up with uh, the idea of, of natural variability. That's right. So a lot of times we hear from um, other people that they're aware of the fact that there have been significant changes in our climate in the past. Um, and so they talk about that and then they suggest that maybe what we're facing is like that. But as you pointed out, Brian, the situation um, is sort of like this. 
yes, it's true that here in Spokane in the winter, the temperature is quite cold and in the summer it's quite warm. But the change from December 21st to June 21st takes us about six months. But if my house were to catch on fire, I might experience a 90 degree change in temperature in the house in a couple of minutes. And it's the speed of that change that makes it dangerous and out unsettling and an outlier. And so, as Brian's pointed out, yes, we've had regular changes over tens of thousands of years. And now we're talking about changes over a century that are you know, happening at an extraordinarily high rate. So we're not usually concerned when we go from winter in Spokane to summer in Spokane, but we're usually concerned when the temperature in our house increases by 90 degrees in 10 minutes, so. So if it's not natural variability and it's not the sun, uh, what is it the most, the third most likely explanation is that we've changed something about uh, the atmospheric blanket around our planet. Um, you, you might be aware of the fact that um, we have a naturally occurring um, a chemical blanket, right? uh, what frequently referred to as a, a greenhouse effect around our planet. And that in fact, that greenhouse effect is natural and good. That the earth would be 20 degrees Celsius colder. It would be a solid ball of ice. Uh, it, would be, it would be frozen to the equator if we did not have uh, naturally occurring CO2, methane in our atmosphere and water vapor trapping a certain amount of the heat in, in, as a, as a, under that blanket in, uh, against the surface of the, of, the, of the earth, increasing the temperature. So the greenhouse effect is natural and it's good for those of us, especially that are warm blooded animals. Uh, the, the problem is that we are contributing more of those same chemicals and adding to the thickness of that blanket. So uh, being a good environmentalist here in Spokane, uh, uh, when it's cold, I, I just encourage all of us to, to put on yet another blanket. And eventually, eventually that works. Like, if, you know, it might require four or five blankets. <laughs> After a while, it gets a little absurd. But eventually, you'll have enough blankets uh, that it'll trap that heat against your body, right? It won't allow, there will be too many layers for it to all to quickly escape. And, and it's, we're doing something similar. We're thickening the atmosphere blanket of the earth uh, by adding more of those same chemicals that are naturally occurring. So they sometimes re refer to it as a, an enhanced greenhouse effect in the sense of enhancing, adding more carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide to the atmosphere, trapping more heat. Uh, in fact, then if we look at the, the evidence, well, we, if, again, if we look at, at temperature again, remember we looked at temperature a little while ago at, at last 800,000 years, that's the light blue line. And then we superimpose the carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. What we find is that they track each other rather closely, right? That, that um, as carbon dioxide goes up, so does temperature. And as carbon dioxide goes down, so does temperature. And so this is why um, the world scientists have, have said that the most likely explanation, the phrase they use is extremely likely, and by that they mean a greater than 95% likelihood that the most likely explanation for most of the warming that we've experienced is that it's caused by human activity uh, enhancing that greenhouse effect and trapping more heat in our atmosphere. This is a zoomed in version for the last uh, 120 years where we have instrumentational uh, record um, where we, we've been measuring it. And again, when we superimpose carbon dioxide, which is the gray line, uh, that we find that they track each other again. So carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, is typically a, been for the last uh, million years or so has been around 280 parts per million. So if you counted a million molecules in the atmosphere, 280 of them would have been carbon dioxide over the last million years. We, we really didn't go much beyond 280 parts per million. Uh, we are right now over 400 parts per million, which is more than it has been in the last million years on the Earth. Uh, uh, and you'll notice also then also the question about speed. It goes up, it varies, but over many thousands of years, it varies. Here we have, a, the, this is, this is um, unusual <laughs> to, to put it euphemistically. That's, that's not uh, at all typical or, or safe. So 
Is it the sun? Could be, but it's not, right? Um, is it natural variability? Could have been, but but it's not. Um, uh, the most likely explanation is that, yes, we are absolutely releasing more chemicals into the atmosphere that are modifying that, that atmospheric blanket and trapping more heat. So if we were to summarize this even more concisely than that, uh, we might say, yeah, it's warming. Yep, it's us. Experts agree. It's bad. Uh, but, you know, if we wanted to, we can, we can fix it. And so in the next unit, what we'd like to talk about, um, switching from the science to the theology and to the ethics, is to envision together what would it mean to fix it? What do we mean by fixing climate change? If we had the political will, what is it that exactly we would do? So to set this conversation up, what we'd like to do is to show the first five minutes of a movie by Naomi Klein and, and her spouse, Avi Lewis, uh, called This Changes Everything. It's a movie based upon her book of the same title, uh, This Changes Everything. And so I'll show just the first five minutes of that in order to set up a little bit of, of context for this next segment of our talk. Can I be honest with you? I've always kind of hated films about climate change. What is it about those vanishing glaciers and desperate polar bears that makes me want to click away? Is it really possible to be bored by the end of the world? It's not that I don't care what happens to polar bears. It's just that we're told that the cause isn't out there. It's in us. It's human nature. We're innately greedy and short-sighted. And if that's true, there is no hope. But when I finally stopped looking away, traveled into the heart of the crisis, met people on the front lines, I discovered so much of what I thought I knew was wrong. And I began to wonder, what if human nature isn't the problem? What if even greenhouse gases aren't the problem? What if the real problem is a story, one we've been telling ourselves for 400 years? This first struck me in the craziest place. I was in a stately home in the English countryside that looked an awful lot like Downton Abbey. It was an invitation-only meeting hosted by the world's oldest scientific organization, the Royal Society. Instead of ordering around the servants, the people here were trying to order around the sun. I mean the sun in the sky. They were discussing a plan to spray chemicals into the stratosphere to turn down the temperature for planet Earth. What you need to do is put a small number of particles up in the upper part of the atmosphere. And those particles will deflect just a tiny bit of light. One garden hose to the sky could eliminate global warming for the entire northern hemisphere. In other words, let's solve the problem of pollution with more pollution. So people are terrified about talking about this because uh -huh. they're scared that it will prevent us cutting emissions. Right, and also that it's sulfuric acid. <laughs> I think you're bearing the lead. Is there any possible way this could come back to bite us in the ass? <laughs> Blanketing the earth in sulfuric acid is I'm all for it. Here's the thing. This idea may be crazy, but it's also totally logical within the story that the Royal Society pioneered in the 17th century. Here's how it goes. The Earth is not, as most people thought back then, a mother to be feared and revered. No. 
science had granted men godlike powers. The Earth is a machine, and we are its engineers, its masters. We can sculpt it like a country garden. We can extract from it whatever we want. These scientists help turn the mother into the mother load. This story is where the long road to global warming began. When I realized that, I stopped tuning out those sad polar bears because unlike human nature, stories are something we can change. So Naomi Klein's premise, as you just heard, is that one explanation for why uh, we have found ourselves at this moment of, of ecological crisis is that, well, of course, humans are inherently greedy and selfish and that we have no choice but to end up in this state because that's just what we are. And she she thinks this account is, is wrong because uh, if it were, well, for, or she hopes it's wrong because if it were true, uh, it, that it's just human nature to, to be inherently destructive, uh, then there's no hope, as she puts it, because presumably if it's if it's inherent part of what we are, then we can't can't change it. But she doesn't think this is true. She thinks that we have arrived at this moment uh, because of uh, she puts it a story, because of a story that we've been telling about ourselves, what we are, and how we're related to nature. That we had this story that started at least 400 years ago that we are the lords and masters of nature. It's engineers that it's here for us to do as we want. And that it's that story that we've been telling to ourselves about ourselves that has arrived, uh, uh, helped us to arrive at this moment of crisis. And she takes some solace in this because as she notes at the end, um, uh, stories are, are something we can change, that we can choose to adopt new stories. And what we'll find is that this actually is, is interestingly similar uh, to something that Pope Francis is suggesting in Laudato Si. What I'd like to suggest that we do together is to uh, combine the idea of fixing climate change, right? And say, what do we mean by fixing it? With this idea of, of changing and adopting a new story, uh, bring them together and suggest what story uh, about ourselves would, would help us to fix climate change. So part of the idea here is that how we define the problem will then also determine what counts as a solution to that problem. So uh, the first answer So the first answer that I think we hear in, among society is if we're going to fix climate change and adopt a new story, uh, what we need to do is become more sustainable, right? Sustainability is I think the, the dominant discussion if we were to try and uh, poll people, we'd probably find that sustainability is the most common way that we currently popularly describe uh, fixing climate change. And then, you know, as, as, a, as a philosopher, I, I get to ask annoying things like, well, but, but what exactly do we mean by sustainability? What, what does that concept really mean? Uh, one of the most common definitions of sustainability comes from the United Nations in 1987, the Brundtland Commission defined sustainability as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. As far as it goes, it seems that this is a really good definition of sustainability, right? In the sense that it would be bad to do things today that would make it impossible for future generations to survive. But exactly what does that future look like that if we were to achieve it? If we were to achieve a sustainable future and we picture in our mind's eye, what does it look like? Um, and, and I think for many of us, what we, we imagine is maybe some sort of a Jetsons-like future. Um, I'm not sure if, if you uh, recall this, this uh, cartoon, Pat, I'm sure that you, that, that you do. I'm, my students tell me, my 20 something students tell me that they know what the Jetsons is. And I just, I, I want to believe that they're not lying to me. So uh, maybe the internet keeps everything new. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this uh, cartoon, it's uh, from the 1960s, Hannah and Barbera production. It's supposed to depict a technological utopia uh, from the perspective of mid 20th century America. So what do we know about this, this bright, shiny technological future is that first of all, we've got uh, flying cars and we're up uh, in semi space in these little hermetically sealed bubbles. And uh, so it's, it's meant to be seen as what progress will look like. Uh, so is it progress? You, you tell me, um, well, first of all, 
we know that, uh, well, apparently the, their version of progress is, is getting, getting rid of uh, Dr. McCormick and I and replacing us with uh, TeachBot 5000. So we don't have teachers unions anymore. Or so clearly, clearly pros. We don't have that either. They, say again? You don't have face-to-face -face teaching anymore either. <laughs> That's right. It was a pandemic that led to this, I'm sure. <laughs> so furthermore, we know that society uh, in their vision in the future is still centered on what's most important, um, namely, of course, shopping. Uh, if you recall in the opening montage of this cartoon, George Jetson, the, the father is giving his credit card and, and cash to his wife and daughter to go shopping. It's very much depicting mid 20th century consumer culture. Uh, and, and so uh, rather maybe depressingly, uh, it's interesting to note that they were depicting what they thought the year 2000 would look like. So we are 20 years past the future. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you were alive on Y2K, uh, then apparently this is what it looked like. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, let's look at this a little bit more and say, um, is this what we want to create? Engineers ask, uh, you know, how do I do this? Elon Musk, I'm sure, is working on a flying car right now. Uh, but ethicists uh, and theologians ask, uh, ought we to do this? Is this what we want? Not how do we do it, but should we do it? And if we scratch the surface of the Jetsons, you know, we ask questions like, what happened down below? Why are we not on the surface of the planet anymore? What, 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 I don't know. It's, I don't know that they were trying to make a comment about this, but it seems that part of what progress involves is no longer having access to wilderness, oceans and mountains, forests and rivers and streams, wild animals, any kind of nature whatsoever. In fact, even air, we're in hermetically sealed bubbles at all times. Uh, and so apparently that's progress. Uh, okay. And then I'm, I'm, that notion of sustainability that's being offered here, it seems to me, is not unlike the question a lot of us are asking right now, when are we going to get back to normal um, in terms of the COVID pandemic? And that is, will a technological fix like the vaccine allow us to return to the lives that we had a year ago? But the difficulty with that is that a lot of us have discovered that there were things wrong with those lives, and that is that um, people of color and immigrants and poor people and um, lots of others who are suffering from injustices in the society. So if our only aim is to get back to the status quo or to get rid of the um, toxic effects of uh, climate change, but not to, under, not to address the underlying issues, the moral and theological, political and economic questions, then we are trapped in that Jetson bubble, you know. I worry that if we scratch the surface of the bright, shiny Jetsons, we get actually <clears throat> another cartoon, a little bit more contemporary. Uh, I'm not sure if, if uh, you at home have watched this movie. Uh, if you have access to stream it, I highly recommend it. It's very entertaining. Um, animated video call from Pixar called WALL-E. The premise is pretty straightforward. Basically, uh, humans have consumed everything. We've destroyed all life on the planet. There's no living thing left on the planet. Um, all that's left is a lot of trash. And so we invented little robots, these little Wally robots, whose one function is to take our trash and, and to, to compact it into nice little cubes and to stack it into nice big piles. Uh, this is trash. This is trash. These are buildings, right? This is the state of, of the world. Uh, and, you know, it's rather desolate, as you might imagine. Uh, but humans are uh, no longer on the planet anyway. We've had to abandon it. Uh, we are living in space. So this is a different version of the space um, utopia. Uh, we are off in space in these giant spaceships. And, well, um, you tell me, technological utopia or not. First of all, uh, we don't have to walk anymore because I guess walking is for suckers. Uh, you only float everywhere and you only ever interact via screens. That seems a little bit too close to home at the moment. You drink all your calories. Going to the beach looks interesting. Uh, <laughs> even though this movie was recorded more than a decade ago, all I can see now is appropriately spaced six feet apart, which is <laughs> sort of... Uh, I love this movie and I love, I love the images like this. Welcome to economy. 
eat, 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 shop, 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 buy, shop, live. Uh, in this technological utopia, it is not run by a set of nations, but rather by a corporation called BNL, BNL, which was, was big and large. <laughs> uh, and it's a spoof on, at the time, on Walmart today, we would say uh, on, on Amazon. And uh, the reason I bring it up is uh, because I'd like to go back to our definition of sustainability and say, what, are we, what is the fix that we're trying to bring about? If what we're trying to bring about is sustainability defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs, what we find in this, this movie is that humans seem to have figured out the technological hurdles and we have been in space, not just for a little while, but for generations, for centuries. It seems that we have figured out our energy problems and our waste problems and that we can do this, this world indefinitely. It's fully sustainable, but is it good? And what worries me, what, what I realized in thinking about this is if what we mean by fixing climate change, if the story we're supposed to adopt is that we're supposed to become sustainable, if, if we can have futures which are sustainable but not good, then it seems that sustainability by itself is not enough. In particular, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned in at least three ways about using sustainability as our primary moral concept. First, uh, it's anthropocentric, which is just a fancy philosopher's way of saying it's, it's, it's human-centered. It's only concerned with present and future humans. And although, to be clear and on the record here on video, I'm in favor of humans, uh, I think we're swell. I also think that all sorts of other th sorts of things on the planet are also pretty swell. Uh, and so um, why are we not trying to, um, to try and protect them as well? Secondly, it tends to be uh, technophilic or, or technology loving. Sustainability approaches, uh, the, the type of fixes that they propose are that we need to invent the right kind of technologies and deploy them that really all environmental problems are uh, fundamentally management problems. We need to just invent the right technology and deploy it. Uh, in the video, the gentleman who said, one garden hose to the sky, right? If we put sulfuric um, dioxide in, into the upper atmosphere, well, that's a technophilic approach, right? We just sort of invent our way out, out of the problem. And third, I would, would like to suggest that sustainability uh, is actually in the end, not really a moral concept at all. It's more of a thermodynamic concept masquerading as an ethical concept. It has to do with what kinds of processes can be done indefinitely, but by itself, it gives us no way of figuring out which things ought to be sustained. It, it presupposes we know what is good and says make what is good sustainable, but it, again, it gives us no way of figuring out what is good. To be dramatic, you can have a, a sustainable concentration camp, but that doesn't make it good. That X is sustainable, doesn't by itself tell us whether X is good. So this creates a problem because sustainability doesn't give us any way of deciding and figuring out what is good. By default, what it's trying to do is to maintain the status quo's notion of what is good. Uh, and I don't think it's too controversial to say that for much of our society, uh, what is good is, is, is wealth consumption, economic growth is trying to um, make late stage consumer society sustainable. Make consumption sustainable seems to be by default what we're talking about without really saying it. Um, and the problem with that, or one of the many problems with that, is that uh, that life of, of, of infinite, attempt to infinitely consume is, is neither fulfilling for the, the winners nor, nor the losers of, of that particular game. Uh, neither one is ultimately satisfied as, as uh, the Dalai Lama once, once put it, trying to satisfy ourselves uh, uh, through consumption is like drinking salt water to satisfy our thirst, right? The more we drink, the thirstier we get. There's never any satiation uh, to be had in, in this infinite consumptive model. So in the second section, we'd like to consider an additional answer to what we might mean by fixing climate change, a new story to tell about ourselves and our relationship to nature, this is the idea of stewardship. 
So exactly though, what do we mean by stewardship? Just first of all, to be clear, I, I, I want to, to be, um, I hope it's obvious, but I wanna make it clear that we of course do urgently and quickly need to decarbonize energy and transportation if we're going to survive, right? And sustainability is in part about su survival. Um, so we need to do those things, we definitely do, um, but we, we need to do more than just survive. Hopefully we can actually try and, and do better than that. And so what I'm suggesting in a way is perhaps we could combine the notion of sustainability and stewardship. And so then we could ask, well, what, what do we mean by this idea of, of being a steward? And here, I think we get really interesting um, perspective from the 2015 encyclical from Pope Francis, Laudato Si, on care for our common home. This is a rather remarkable document. And if you have not read it, I would strongly encourage you to just Google Laudato Si PDF and you can download a free English version of this. It's written for all people of goodwill in a surprisingly approachable um, uh, framework where, where it's uh, meant to be uh, read by, by, by anyone, uh, regardless of expertise. I'm just gonna summarize quickly what I think are some of the key features of this remarkable document. First, Pope Francis explicitly rejects anthropocentrism and says it, we, and it explicitly says humans are not the only things within intrinsic value. Yes, we, we have a, you know, we have this uh, wonderful dignity and, and worth, absolutely, but we're not the only beings. In fact, every being uh, that it, God created, uh, it also has value that every animal, every plant, uh, declares God's glory in that very um, St. Francis sort of way, uh, every species, uh, all ecosystems, that we're not separate from nature. We're a part of it. We are a part of creation uh, and we're not in a bubble outside of it and in some Jetsonian sort of way, right? Out, as though uh, there were something outside of nature, whatever that would, would mean. Um, and so that's part of this is rejecting that uh, modern view that we get from people like Descartes and, and Francis Bacon, Thomas Hobbes, that we're, uh, we're, we're completely separate and distinct from nature. And Pope Francis rejects that dualism explicitly. Um, he in, furthermore explicitly suggests that we need to reinterpret the, the biblical notion of dominion. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in, in a moment. Uh, and further, not only are we meant to see ourselves as stewards, but that we should see ourselves as caring for our common home. And then finally, um, like uh, St. John Paul II before him, uh, he also argues that we should reject what he calls the technocratic paradigm, seeing things like climate change as not merely a technical problem, but also ultimately a moral problem. And we'd like to talk a little bit more specifically about points six, seven, and eight today with you. And before we do that, um, we just want to reflect for a moment on the insight that Naomi Klein offers us at the beginning of this section. If the issue for us to address here is that we need to change the story, and what we've seen so far is that the use of sustainability within the context of late 20th century uh, consumerism is a story that's focused only on preserving the status quo of the advantage of humanity or the advantage of rich humanity in the world. And so it's kind of a story of human beings floating around in an ark by themselves. The shift to another story, the story of stewardship, at least begins to recognize that we're in relationship with non-human plants and animals, that we have a bind or a tie to these. And we begin to think of ourselves in terms of our duties or obligations to the rest of creation. We're gonna see maybe some limits to this notion of stewardship and that what Francis does in Laudato Si is he begins to enrich even the idea of stewardship with the idea of care or concern. The notion here is that in the past, Christianity might have embraced the notion of dominion, which acknowledged our relationship uh, to the rest of creation, but gave us a kind of mastery or lordship that's now we recognize as false and hurtful. So the movement from sustainability over dominion through stewardship is drawing us to something where we recognize our intimate and caring relationship uh, to these other 
living creations on the planet. Okay. So regarding uh, reinterpreting dominion, right? We know from Genesis that we that are given dominion over the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. Uh, what Pope Francis rather rem remarkably points out is that some Christians throughout the ages have incorrectly interpreted these passages. Uh, they have taken the idea of having dominion as, uh, as too often being interpreted as having domination over uh, those other things. And that he wants to suggest that this is an incorrect interpretation, that dominion does not entail domination, if we understand it properly, that it is not uh, that we are, uh, as, as Naomi Klein was putting it right, that we see ourselves as engineers of the planet, right? And, th and that that's a false narrative. A false story. Too often, he notes, we've had um, an inadequate view of, of what he calls Christian anthropology, which if I were to translate that, I would have suggested he, he used not anthropology, but, but human nature. We've had an inadequate view uh, of the Christian view of human nature, uh, which is interesting to point out in the context of Klein's video again, wherein we had the wrong account of what we, we are. What was that wrong account? It was some sort of Promethean view in which we were seen to have mastery over nature, Pope Francis says, and that wherein we ridiculed uh, the faint-hearted care uh, about, uh, about, the, the, about the rest of creation. Instead, he points out, dominion does not mean domination. Does, dominion does not mean control and mastery. What dominion means is responsible stewardship. What does that mean? Well, what, one thing I would like to point out is that for some people, when I think many Christians realize that stewardship is a much better metaphor for thinking of our relationship to nature. What worries me to be perfectly honest is that too often we, we still maintain a rather rational detached notion of stewardship wherein stewardship rather quickly and too easily becomes a, a, a version of, of sustainability resource management because we use stewardship language about how we interact with forests and livestock. Um, I'm not persuaded that that's actually what Pope Francis is talking about. And, and this was first made clear to me when, when I read an interview from Cardinal Turkson, who was probably one of, uh, of the people assisting in the writing of, of La Dato Si. And Cardinal Turkson points out that actually, in term, if you look at the document, it doesn't use stewardship as its primary metaphor. The, do, the word actually only appears twice. Whereas he, would, he points out that the, the, one of the primary lenses for interpretation, the primary concepts that, that Pope Francis is trying to uh, suggest is that care uh, is, is the primary emphasis. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, what's the difference between talking about stewardship and talking about care? And, and uh, I think it would be good for you to just sort of, if you want to, to pause and, and reflect on that. What, how, what do they connote for you? What are, what are the differences between care and stewardship? Feel free to pause it video if you'd like and to think about that. Um, I myself, as I reflect on this, would suggest that uh, stewardship is easily left at a rational, rational detachment. Uh, whereas Pope Francis is suggesting that, that care uh, involves a relationship and involves an expression of concern that when you take care of something because you care about it and you care for it, that expression, that outflowing of, of love and is, is, is because of a relationship you have with it is different than just stewarding something in an intellectually detached sort of way that's uh, at a distance. I'm not sure about you, Pat. What do you think about when you think of the difference between care and stewardship? Right. I do think that the language of stewardship has so many echoes of ownership. And that is, we often think of the steward as an agent who's acting on behalf of a distant owner. And so, and his or the steward's responsibility is primarily to this distant landowner. And in the context of history, you know, this would often be the, the unjust landowner or the slaveholder. And so the steward would often be a retainer who would, would work for them. And, and so one has a sense here that the steward is really um, 
you know, unless it's enriched by this notion, as you've said, of care and of love, then we don't have that sense. Um, and what we're looking for, I think, in, in Francis' um, description here, is more the kind of love that, um, that a, um, a relative has, that a parent, a mother, a father, a sibling has. And that is that they care, not because they've been placed in charge or because there are expectations of them, but because of their affection and their bond, which unites them. And I think that in that sense, um, that uh, stewardship pulls us away from sustainability, but we still need to go a step further here. This seems to, according to Pope Francis, put a special burden on educators, because if the goal is to develop a, this care, this, this, this attitude from uh, where we, where we have a expression of care and concern that's a natural upwelling of, of spontaneously of concern, that cultivation requires a, a conversion as we'll, we'll talk about and more, right? That this raises the bar. It's not just about educating our students to understand the problem, it's right. It's it's actually trying to help them to become uh, and to develop a different kind of conception of themselves and the relationship to the rest of the world, and to see their interaction with it as an expression of care and love, requires quite a bit then of of additional work on our part as educators to help them to develop that, to elicit that, and to embrace that in in our students. Right, and to pick up on Naomi Klein's theme here. And that, that means that we have to be able to tell a story or stories to our young people, to our students that will evoke in them a sense of love and care um, for creation and for the natural order. And I would suggest that, you know, even a, a close reading of Genesis 1 to 2, 4 in that creation story, the Sabbath creation of the six days and the seventh day of rest, that the authors really describe how beautiful and vibrant and wonderful the world is that God has made and that God sees that glory and that beauty and pauses, you know, seven times to admire and to be awestruck by it. And so, you know, one of our obligations or our callings as teachers around this particular issue is to help evoke the beauty um, that the poet and that the artist and that the creator sees uh, in the natural world and to open and to warm the hearts of our students um, to these things. Which brings us to the notion of, of kinship. And I would say that um, what we, that Francis actually starts with Laudato, starts Laudato Si by drawing on two very powerful metaphors of kinship, um, describing the earth both as our nurturing mother and as our wounded sister, a sister who's been injured by our irresponsible behavior. And the advantage of this kinship metaphor is that it rejects any kind of anthropocentrism that sees us as an isolated or superior individual with a false or detached sense of mastery or surrogate lordship over nature. Instead, kinship reminds us that we are companions of all creation that we are fashioned of the same dust and that we need the same food, drink, and breath. And we draw this from the same soil, seas, and air. And that by so deeply immersing us uh, in this world, kinship awakens in us a, an intimate sense of our solidarity, of our sisterliness and brotherliness um, with and our need to care for and to love all of creation. Uh, and so I think Francis is really trying to awaken that sense in us. Um, many of us have had the experience, I know, Brian, you've had this experience that when a second child comes into our family and that first child recognizes her sister or her brother for the first time, it evokes such joy and care and tenderness in the slightly older child. And I think Francis is really trying to do that with us, trying to have us recall and remember this kinship. And so, um, by doing those things, it attempts to waken that up for us. Um, the other thing that we see in, in the document is that Francis repeatedly warns us that different kinds of distance from creation and from the poor have a tendency to harden our hearts against the sufferings that we inflict on both nature 
and the poor in this ecological crisis. And so the gap between the rich and the poor, the gap between humanity and creation uh, tends to create a distance um, that hardens us to these kinds of realities. So when he begins the encyclical um, by describing the earth as something more and closer to us than our very neighbor, as something as intimate as our, as our mother and our sister, I believe that Francis is evoking or echoing Adam's line when Adam recognizes Eve as bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, that, that intimate connection we have with other creatures and suggests that we are indeed our siblings keeper, that this connection evokes in us a love and a care that would want us to take care uh, of our sister and our mother. And that kinship places us deeply in the natural world, not above it like the, um, the Jepsons are living uh, above the clouds, but in down in the world uh, as both child and sibling and calls us to love and to care for that world. And so uh, it evokes something um, stronger than um, stewardship uh, in evoking us to, to uh, experience both this love and this care. So if we were to go back and compare uh, sort of the, the, the notion of sustainability as we first looked at it, as we, we found a, a, its orientation was, was largely technical, but now we're getting this idea that maybe we could combine sustainability, stewardship and care and get a, a deeper notion a, as a result. Yes, we need to decarbonize uh, energy and transportation quickly, but but more we also need to uh, develop new attitudes, uh, new lifestyles, new assumptions. Uh, we need to be learn, uh, as he powerfully puts it in, in the encyclical, to hear the cries of the poor and the cry of the earth, both. And that the aims then are are importantly different, right? That the call, the the, the requirement here is not just to invent enough forms of technology to allow us to continue to consume. Uh, that as Pope Francis puts it, we need to be willing and uh, to, to uh, reconsider and develop a new definition of progress. We need to progress toward a, an end that's actually uh, going to, to achieve um, the, our goals and our, our, uh, our destiny. So the, the final, point is, is to this idea of, of the rejection of what he calls the technocratic uh, paradigm. And this is a theme that has been running throughout Catholic social teaching for the last 30 years, that the ecological crisis is a moral problem. And what that means is it has to do with our underlying attitudes, assumptions, beliefs, and values, that it's a spiritual problem that can therefore only be solved because it's a, it's a, because it's a moral problem, it can only be solved uh, uh, by uh, a moral solution, right? Meaning, uh, re meaning that we need to be able to to develop, elicit uh, this ecological conversion, right? Otherwise, as he puts it, we're merely dealing with symptoms. Here's the passage wherein he was describing this idea of of redefining our notion of of progress, I believe, right? It's a pretty striking passage, right? It's not enough to just say, let's do those things that, 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 are, that we can do today that are, that are cost-effective in, in a narrow, narrowly defined way. Uh, these half measures uh, really will only stave off disaster for a short time. And, and furthermore, they're really uh, in service of the wrong notion of the wrong version of progress. So to summarize this section then, um, if we go back to our initial framework and said, what kind of problem is climate change? What would it mean to really fix it, right? If we want to fix it, uh, what would a fix look like? We have contrasted then one version which suggests the problem to be solved is climate change. And that the, the goal is to try to figure out how to uh, achieve happiness through consumption and to therefore make that consumption sustainable. Um, on the other hand, we have then contrasted that with the idea that it's not merely a technical problem, but it's ultimately also a moral problem that climate change isn't actually the problem. Climate change is a symptom of the problem. 
and that happiness is is going to require more of us. And the goal to sort of connect this with, with Dr. McCormick's idea of kinship, in a sense, the goal is to become a healthy functioning part of a healthy functioning community of life. Um, to take our place within that community as a member of that community uh, with, with kinship and appropriately uh, appropriate relationships, right? If, if justice is about right relation to ourselves, to others, our neighbors, to our God and to our world, uh, then 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 uh, an attitude of justice requires us to develop that. And I hear if we had more time, we'd talk about Thomas Berry uh, and his work does a beautiful job of, of talking about this and says that we need to stop seeing nature as a collection of objects, but, but rather as a, a communion of subjects. And I think that's very much in line uh, with, with what Pope Francis is suggesting. And to pick up on that, you know, Francis talks in the encyclical about, as you pointed out, about not just paying attention to the symptoms or addressing the symptoms. And to go back to our metaphor about the difference between weather and climate being the difference between surface temperature and core temperature. You know, if, if I was running a high fever of 101 or 102 degrees, I mean, I suppose what you could do is you could put an ice pack on my forehead and drop my temperature, or you could put me you know, in an ice bath, but that doesn't actually address the underlying dis-ease in my body and the diseased relationship between my body and, and the larger environment. And in order to make me well again, in order to make me healthy, I, you know, I have to diagnose the underlying problem and I have to come to grips with it. So um, spreading chemicals into the atmosphere um, is like putting ice on the forehead. It, you know, it, it might, it might drop the skin temperature of my head so that my, so that when you put your hand on it, it doesn't feel like I have a fever, but it hasn't actually addressed the underlying problem. And so the Pope is really arguing here that if we're going to really address this, we have to address the whole issue, which means we have to address the issue holistically and, and come to look at our relationship, as Brian said, um, to others, to the world, to nature, and to our God. Well said. In our very final uh, section then, we'd like to just share a few reflections uh, on uh, the role of, of integral ecology, which is what Pope Francis describes his, his overall vision in Laudato Si is, is integral ecology and what it means in the Catholic school classroom. How do we go about trying to teach uh, for ecological conversion? So in this section, uh, I, I love this quotation from uh, the political scientist in Oberlin, uh, Dr. Uh, David Orr, who, who pointed out that the ecological crisis can't be solved by the same kind of education that helped created the problem. It seems to me that this creates an interesting issue for us as educators that he, part of his point as I take it is that we've arrived at this moment of ecological crisis um, because of the people we've educated, because of the way that we've educated people, and we've uh, that it's in some ways not a bug in the system, but, but perhaps a feature of the system that we've created educationally, and that if we want to get a different result, then we might need to embrace a different model of education. That it need to be it needs to be more than just technical education, which I think Catholic uh, education has has always realized, and that um, this gives us. Uh, in the context of the ecological crisis, uh, an additional way of thinking about that, that important, rich, uh, long project that we've all been a part of. Uh, in the encyclical itself, Pope Francis uh, puts it this way, environmental education needs educators capable of developing an ethics of ecology, helping people through effective pedagogy to grow in solidarity, responsibility, and compassionate care, right? This is our, our duty obligation, our challenge as, an, as educators. And that by environmental education, this, I, this, is, this is not just something that should be happening with someone who identifies themselves as an environmental educator. If we, if we silo it and, and separate it from the core of what we're doing, if we make it an ornament on the ed, you know, at the, at the fringe of, a, of, our, of the tree, will have failed. We need to, I would argue, infuse this work deep into the trunk of what we're doing as, as educators and see it as, as a central part of our project 
uh, central to uh, Catholic social teaching and to educating people uh, to, to live and thrive and survive in, in this uh, particular age. Right. What are some of the challenges and opportunities? I would suggest first that um, young people are really motivated by, excited about, concerned about, uh, about the climate crisis. And so I found that in finding creative ways of incorporating climate change into English classes, history classes, and yes, of course, chemistry and biology, but also math and theology and ethics, and right? That um, finding opportunities to thoughtfully incorporate it into and across our curricula is a wonderful opportunity for engaging students. Uh, by using, for example, you have to do math sets and practice, uh, but you don't have to just talk about, um, you know, how long a train takes to get from St. Louis to Pittsburgh. You could also, you could instead look at climate data sets. Uh, and, and so you're learning the same mathematical quantitative concepts, but now you're doing it in the context of, of climate change. You need to learn about and talk about great literature in English, but you could choose to uh, supplement it with great literature uh, about the environment. Um, all of these are ways of, uh, and there are many others about in, in sort of evoking uh, an ecological awareness and conversion uh, that, that is needed. Uh, secondly, uh, a, a significant part of the project, especially for those of us who are uh, coming out of the, the, you know, the, the Jesuit Catholic uh, education tradition, but really I would hope all Catholic educators as expressed nicely by, by uh, um, the, you know, the Fides et Ratio encyclical is, is that we have the, an, an, a holistic vision wherein we don't have faith over here and reason over there, uh, that, the, that there's one truth and that right reason and true faith ultimately agree. And, uh, you know, there've been conversations for, for decades uh, about the, that opportunity to do religion, science, dialogue in the context of things like uh, evolution. But here we have, with climate science, a wonderful opportunity to, to see the, the whole, the integrity and the, the, right, the integral ecology, the, the unity of faith and reason in the context of climate science is a wonderful opportunity uh, to be embodying an important goal of Catholic education to not graduate students who, who divide their mind in two halves. And then third, of course, we need and want to graduate students to, to go out into our world, uh, to be people who can, uh, can and uh, hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, as Pope Francis puts it. Uh, and this seems to me, as he uh, notes repeatedly, consistently is, is so urgently needed. And this is at the heart of, of uh, should be at the heart of our project as Catholic school educators. Right. And to, to pick up on those themes, I think we, we've both encountered a, a large number of students today, particularly, you know, um, each, each younger generation is, is more frightened and more concerned about the dangers and the threats of climate change. And so when they come into our classrooms, it's very important for them that we're willing to address these kinds of questions and talk about them, because we want to avoid this sort of cognitive dissonance that students experience when their world is experiencing a great deal of tumult, but they come into the classroom and we address things in an abstract or academic fashion. So this is a great concern for the young generation, the generation of youth today. And so in the classroom, we have a duty really um, to talk to them about these kinds of questions. Um, and because they, they have a right to be able to turn to us um, for expertise and for guidance and for wisdom, and for leadership uh, and for a real education about the world in which they are living and the world in which they know they're going to live in the future. And as Brian pointed out, it's, it's also important that they see a connection between their world of faith and religion and the world of reason and science because they know they're going to need both of these resources to deeply understand what's going on in the world and, have the, and to have the ability to face and to address these kinds of issues. And um, Francis makes it so clear throughout the encyclical that we're not dealing with a single crisis here. We're dealing with both an ecological and a social crisis that threatens both uh, creation and the poor. And so we have to give our students the tools that they're going to need 
um, to be able to face both of these crises together. And so that's why we need a collaborative and integrative approach that engages faith, reason, religion, and science, and, and one that faces the issues that, that really in the hearts and minds of our students. So Francis makes it really clear. He says this um, several times throughout the encyclical, but um, says it quite clearly in paragraph 63 that the complexity of the ecological crisis and its multiple causes means that solutions will not emerge from just one way of interpreting and transforming reality. We can't, we can't hope to find a specific discrete answer for each part of the ecological problem. We need strategies that demand an integrated approach to combating poverty and restoring dignity to the excluded and to protecting nature. Now, what that means for us as teachers, I think, is that education on climate change will require the sources of every discipline in dialogue and conversation with one another. We need to educate our students holistically about climate change because there's no one possible source of wisdom that's going to be able to answer this problem. And we're going to need to incorporate an integrated approach to the crisis that is both ecological and as Francis argues, social. So that's a good thing for us in our Catholic tradition. I mean, uh, our commitment to educate the whole person and also to educate them holistically will put us on good footing uh, to address this uh, crisis. To go back to Naomi Klein's way of putting it in terms of a story, um, science is able to tell us what's happening and why, but it isn't able to tell us what, what, where we're headed where are we going? What ends uh, are we ending? Why are we, are we trying to bring about? What is the world we want to, to realize together? Mm. Economics, uh, Dale Jameson from NYU once put, economics can tell us how to achieve our ends efficiently, but not what our ends should be or whether we should be concerned to achieve them efficiently. Right. Uh, it's, it's the function of ethics and of, of, of religion to, uh, to help us to understand those uh, those ends. And, and so one of the things I like about the formulation with Mary McLean and stories is that many different disciplines have really important roles to play in the, in the telling and the weaving of, of new and better stories. Uh, that literature, art, uh, movie making, uh, there are so many opportunities that our young people could, could take advantage of and to help to create these, these better new stories and to see themselves as part of it. And uh, so they're many opportunities in, in class uh, to be embracing in, a, in an even literal way of, of storytelling and story making uh, to, to weave a, a new account uh, because that is sorely needed uh, to be able to truly address the, the root causes of, of, the, of the crisis. Right. Um, and beyond that, Laudato C also argues that dialogue is essential to address the ecological and social crisis and uh, recommends that several paths of dialogue need to be followed as the central lines of approach and action to reverse this crisis. So the Pope sees um, dialogue as an essential tool in our response. And he argues that we must construct transparent and just conversations and shared deliberations, listening to all nations, cultures, and communities, fashioning economic and political dialogues that are focused on the common good and integrating the wisdom of religion, science, and the humanities. Now, his reason for this is in part because the issue is so complex that we're going to need everyone's perspective and everyone's insights. But it's also true that these dialogues are gonna help us to resolve the ecological crisis by transforming ourselves into communities characterized by what Brian called previously right relationships with one another. By our becoming more just, more peaceful, and more caring communities, we're going to live more lightly on the natural world and in the natural world and be in a more compassionate and just relationship with our impoverished neighbors. You know, um, the ecological conversion that Francis calls for in Laudato Si parallels the kind of conversion that the Hebrews experience in their sojourn in the wilderness. And in that sojourn, as they learn to treat each other more justly by sharing the manna they collect each day, um, 
and sharing the labors that they engage in and building the Ark of the Covenant and sharing the land um, that they uh, receive once they enter into Canaan by, by becoming a more just, peaceful, and caring community, they're actually capable of um, sustaining a promised land that will nurture and, and take care of them for generations to come. So this dialogue is, is an essential tool for us in overcoming the ecological uh, crisis because as Brian quoted us at the beginning of this section, uh, we can't solve this problem by thinking the way we have in the past and we can't solve this problem by acting the way we have in the past. And dialogue can teach us to relate to one another differently and to act differently. So teaching about climate change requires that we teach our students to engage in these dialogues. Now, there are different challenges. We've seen that there are reasons why teachers feel uh, discouraged about teaching about climate change, but certainly some challenges to environmental education include the fears that we all have about the losses that are being caused by climate change and also the difficulties of addressing this crisis. Um, these fears of loss and difficulty can keep us from recognizing, discussing, and addressing the problem. It's also true that group biases uh, and tribal loyalties can blind us to the ecological crisis because the other people in our group or organization or community um, resist having these conversations. And it can cause us to dig in or double down when we're challenged about our positions. Uh, or it can lead us to demonize those who don't agree with us. Francis has suggested that education is the key to the ecological conversion that we need in order to see, judge, and act differently. So um, educators and teachers have, a, have an essential role here in helping our students to experience the kind of ecological conversion that's going to be necessary to address uh, climate change. And how can we do that? Well, Uh, move on. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, that was my mistake. Yeah. Um, so Francis suggests that religion and spirituality can provide the emotional and the moral resources to help us face and address our fears and sustain us. And, and we do have those resources in our religious and spiritual traditions. We also have those resources in philosophy and ethics, in literature and the arts and in the humanities. These two can provide us um, with the resources we need to be able to acknowledge and address and sustain us in the struggle. What's also true is that genuine dialogue can help us to recognize and overcome our own group biases, and it can help us to approach others as genuine conversational partners and try to understand them and, and try to uh, dialogue together towards a, a consensus in the future. So it's important for us um, to be able to teach our students and to model dialogue uh, for our students. Teaching climate literacy requires being able to recognize and address the cognitive, moral, and spiritual impediments to our ecological conversion. And it requires identifying and employing cognitive, moral, and spiritual resources to address these blocks. And what this means, what we all know, is that good teachers teach and accompany students not subjects. And so our education about climate literacy is also going to be an education that recognizes that we human beings are trying to teach other human beings about this issue and that there are things that block us from learning about it, but there are also resources that can help us to learn better about it. Okay. The presentation that you've been listening to today is part of a new project that Gonzaga is launching. Um, we're launching uh, this very month, a new project called the Gonzaga Center for Climate Society and the Environment. This is gonna be a new university-wide project that'll be uh, having a, a launch event on Earth Day, April 22nd at 3.30 p.m. and Pacific time. We would encourage you to go and register for the event and attend. Uh, you can find the, the link there uh, and, and feel free to register. 
part of what we hope to do as part of the center is to create what we're calling a climate literacy project, which um, this is this presentation today is sort of trying to ju justify the, the value and need to be uh, creating opportunities to help teachers learn about how they might thoughtfully incorporate climate change into their classroom. Um, in fact, over the course of this year, uh, we've been offering a few professional development workshops to secondary science teachers and, and, and in concrete ways, sharing uh, as part of two, three hour workshops, uh, some of the basics of climate science, how to connect that with some of the, the learning outcomes that they're already pursuing and the different science standards that they have. And then transitioning in a second workshop to concrete lesson plans and ideas for exactly how you would go about thoughtfully including climate change into that work. Uh, the, the presentation today that we're, that we're offering is part of the, uh, a new effort to, to go beyond just, just that work that we've been doing with the public schools in our area and to, to also work with our parochial schools to suggest how we can not only uh, do wonderful work on, on climate science, and we can confuse that, or we can fuse that with Laudato Si, with the vision of integral ecology that we get from Pope Francis. And so uh, this, uh, this spring uh, in April, we will be doing a piloted workshop with our local Jesuit high school, Gonzaga Prep, uh, where we'll be offering two three hour workshops uh, exploring this exact work. And so we are on our way to trying to become a resource to build capacity in our own region to help teachers to learn how to do this. Uh, part of our goal with the Climate Literacy Project from the Gonzaga Center for Climate Society and the Environment is to really help all teachers from K to, to 16 uh, in any discipline in every subject to thoughtfully incorporate uh, climate change and integral ecology into their work. Finally, uh, I as a sort of a shameless plug would mention that uh, in 2015, I wrote this book, Writers in the Storm, Ethics in an Age of Climate Change as a, it's intended as a supplementary course text uh, from Anselm Academic. Uh, as you can see from the table of contents, my goal here is to attempt to summarize an, in, a, in an accessible, interesting way relevant to students um, and to teachers the basics of the science, uh, the basics of the politics and economics, and then and then in the final ch three chapters, uh, some of the ethics. In fact, if you read the book, you'd recognize um, several parts of what we talked about today uh, from that book. And so you might consider uh, taking a look at it. If you go to Anselm Academics website to Writers in the Storm, uh, I believe they're also happy to provide you with an examination copy if you would uh, consider using it as a course text. They, they're usually happy to, to provide you with a complimentary copy to review. So that's the end of our presentation. It was a little bit longer than NCEA was asking for, but um, if you're still with us, apparently you thought it was worth your time, um, feel free to reach out to us at climateliteracy at gonzaga.edu if you have any questions or comments. And um, I, I thank you for, for being with us today. Yes, thanks for joining us and have a lovely day.